financial leadership is changing. CFOs no longer record history. They make history. This podcast will help you become a better leader, strategic thinker, and digital visionary. Welcome to Secrets of Rockstar CFOs, the ultimate podcast for chief financial officers. Follow along as Jack McCullough engages in exciting chat with accomplished CFOs, learning how they overcame obstacles and positioned their companies for the future. Here's your host, Jack McCullough. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Secrets of Rockstar CFOs. My name is Jack McCullough, and I am really excited by our guest today. I am joined by Whitney Joseph who is the CFO of Zoetis. Whitney, thanks for being here today. Jack, thank you very much for having me on here. Uh, I'm not sure I quite meet the uh, criteria uh, of Rockstar CFO, but looking forward to the conversation. <laughs> ah, humility, <laughs> such a quality with you CFO types, but uh, great. Anyway, I, I want to talk about your background, but before we get into that, Zoetis is a great company, but it's not it's not one of the better known companies, and it's but it's a fascinating and important company. I thought maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about that. Absolutely. Uh, interestingly, if someone walked a dog this morning or had some milk in their coffee, then you've been touched by Zoetis uh, already uh, today. Zoetis is the largest animal health company in the world, uh, and we are driven by innovation and really a purpose-driven company uh, to nurture our world and humankind by advancing care for animals. And so we really are innovating to solve our customers' largest, uh, uh, greatest needs, both on the pet care side, uh, where really the human-animal bond uh, with more and more people having pets that are really a part of their family, and that bond is something we want to continue to, uh, to innovate in ways to keep them healthy, right? And then on yeah. the other hand, we are also uh, in, on the uh, livestock side, which is production animals for producers and farmers, our manufacturing products to keep them healthy as well as we look to feed uh, feed the world where we have you know 8 billion people on the planet today expected to go to 10 billion in about 30 years or so wow 8 billion so i'm i'm old enough to remember when like hitting 3 billion and then 5 billion were like considered huge milestones so <laughs> uh, that's fantastic anyway i want to talk a little about your background because it's um a little unusual uh there probably aren't a lot of CFOs of $80 billion companies uh, who grew up in Haiti. And I understand you're one of 10 siblings. Is that correct? That's right. I have uh, nine brothers and sisters. I'm number nine out of 10. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So uh, a little bit, you grew up in Haiti. And, you know, what was that like? I read in an article in Fortune that you were learning English and accounting sort of simultaneously. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's about right. I, I landed in the U.S. at the age of 12. Uh, not speaking any English at all. In fact, I got by by saying yes or no, and I was just guessing. Uh, someone would come up to me and start saying something and asking a question. I would start out by saying yes. And then uh, if their reaction was, you know, really? Uh, then I would change the answer to no. That's basically how I got by the first few weeks. But uh, thankfully, I was able to, to learn the language relatively quickly. And by the time I entered high school, I already went into uh, a finance program because I had such an interest in that area, which I'm sure we'll get into in the conversation. But growing up in Haiti, uh, particularly as a child, you don't have the same level of uh, sort of um, uh, responsibility, right? And and so uh, I feel for my parents for having to feed all of us, and it's a, you know, one of the poorest places in the Western Hemisphere. So, so we had our, our hardships, for sure. Uh, but we also had fun as kids, uh, playing around and so on, and enjoying uh, sort of the, the, the tropical climate atmosphere that is in Haiti. Yeah, I've always been jealous. I grew up with two sisters, um, although I, I met, I was adopted. So two sisters in my adoptive family, but I have uh, nine brothers and sisters outside of the original two who I grew up with. And I, I've always been sort of jealous of people with large families, you know, uh, yeah. but on the other hand, I was the only boy. So I was quite spoiled as a child. It worked out pretty well. <laughs> uh, but, so I have to get a question. So nine brothers and sisters, yes. do you know all their birthdays? Um, no, if I'm honest. So, so we have this thing where we, um, uh, my two of my brothers and I, we, we remind each other. So I'll remind them and say, hey, you know, it's Monique's birthday today. Make sure you call her and uh, they'll do the same. But, uh, but yeah, um, we, we, I do struggle with those sometimes <laughs> still yeah. today. 
a bit, or, you know, naming your aunts, your aunts and uncles, your nephews and nieces and stuff like that. So, yeah, the, well, I, I have, I have over 30 uh, nephews and nieces at this point. So uh, oh if, I, if I include uh, the ones that have, that have their own kids. Uh, and so, yeah. Wow, that's that's a lot of nephews and nieces. So good for you. Anyway, I'd love to talk a little bit about your career. Uh, you started in PwC, your career at PwC, uh, perhaps it was PricewaterhouseCoopers back in the day. And uh, then you went into, you had a, a terrific career growing uh, at Home Depot and in the home improvement sector. And then you moved over to life science. So I'd love to talk a little about that journey because it's such a dramatic switch between industries. Indeed. Look, uh, when I joined Price Waterhouse, it was a couple of years before the Coopers merger. Um, my my number one objective back then was to get as much experience as possible. Uh, and so I would have been the person volunteering for the toughest clients uh, during the summers when things would slow down a little bit. Busy season, of course, starts in January. Uh, I would be the one saying, look, I'll go anywhere uh, as long as there's a project or something that I can uh, get experience from that I would otherwise have to wait a long time to to sort of get that experience locally. And so I never spent a summer for the first, I think, four or five years in the firm. I didn't spend a summer in South Florida, which is where I was based at the time. I was always somewhere else. I spent a summer in Boston working on some clients. I spent a summer in Atlanta and uh, Baltimore, Maryland, area, et cetera. So that was really helpful in terms of getting uh, a more rounded experience and seeing more industries, which is where my interest in different industries really started. Uh, once I left the firm, I went to a company that was called actually Hughes Supply. It was later bought by Home Depot and became Home Depot Supply. And that company, of course, is wholesale distribution, actually. It's not on the retail side of, of the Home Depot business. And there you have really thin margins. And handling you know, cash flow sensitivity is, is heightened. Uh, and so it really helped me to appreciate that a lot more. But what was, uh, the more instrumental uh, thing that happened during those years was that there was a CFO that was hired uh, uh, actually on the same day that I joined the company. We started with the company on the same day. Oh, really? Day. Okay. And he was extremely experienced and really took a number of folks and gave us uh, interesting assignments in, on top of our normal day jobs uh, to do that were critical needs uh, for the finance function. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those and really gave me a lot more exposure to him. Probably the first time that I had the thought of you know, I'd like to be a CFO someday. Uh, was really watching him work and learning from him, and and he gave me you know some stretch assignments that uh, without those I probably wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you today. So that was really instrumental as well. And then when I left there, I always had an interest in life sciences. I think the the purpose and the mission of those companies in terms of what we do both on the human side and now on the animal health side are things that I can attach, that I can identify with. And so I moved to New Jersey back in 2008 and joined a company that does pharma services, essentially doing manufacturing and drug development work for a wide variety of companies across uh, both large and small biotechs uh, um, across the industry and across the globe. So that gave me a lot of exposure to what's in the drug development pipeline, how companies are going about those pursuits, et cetera. So that was also very, very uh, fascinating. Before coming it's to interesting. Zoetis. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you I off said That was before coming to Zoetis. Okay, yeah. And so you, you mentioned this mentor who, you know, obviously made a, a career altering impact on you. And that's fantastic. But now that you are the CFO, have you taken on the role of mentoring some up and coming professionals? Absolutely. And and he wasn't the only one, right? I mean, we could probably fill this whole segment if I were to talk about all the uh, folks who uh, had uh, instrumental uh, impact on me and uh, whether they gave me stretch assignments as mentors or really sponsors, I think, are equally, arguably, maybe more important. Uh, I had a number of sponsors, and of course, you can pick your mentors, and, and you know there are folks who come to me, and I, I don't think I've ever turned down someone who asked me to mentor them in some capacity, whether it's official capacity, formally or informally. And so I do take every opportunity to do that, but also sponsors where we don't actually get to uh, pick our sponsors many times, but we can create them, actually, uh, in terms of how we go about expressing our intentions, uh, what our aspirations are. And then, you know, when we get an opportunity to execute on something, really given it all we've got, I think then you're creating sponsors who have the confidence in you that, that give you opportunities and speak about you when you're not in the room, essentially, right? And so I've had a number of, of sponsors, and I would, I would probably put the, my former company I was with prior to Zoetis, the CEO, I would put him in the category of being a, a sponsor. Uh, certainly, 
uh, put me in a number of different uh, positions, including running a business, which I think uh, makes me a, a better CFO than I would be otherwise. Uh, and so again, number of mentors as well as sponsors uh, have come across uh, that have helped me get here. Yeah, it's interesting because when I did the research for my uh, book on secrets of rockstar CFOs, for which this podcast is named, um, I, I interviewed you know probably forty or so CFOs, and every one of them expressed the importance of having a mentor at some point in their career, and then being a mentor. And certainly, you're you know proof of that as well. So in both directions. So yeah, and actually, I, I take a fairly broad definition of mentors, right? I think. Your peers can be mentors to you as well. I've had a number of those over the years, and I still do today. Uh, and so I, I do think uh, that that can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes uh, and up and down the stack, if you will, in terms of look at the organizational charts. Uh, but then again, uh, as well, I think sponsors are, are critical as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have a Gen Z mentor. And, you know, it's it's one of those reverse mentor type of relationships. We mentor each other. And, you know, she just gives me perspective on the next generation. And, you know, those are the CFOs in 10 or 12 years. And, you know, hopefully she gets, you know, some wisdom of, you know, from my experiences as well. So, yeah, anybody can be a mentor if you want to. But so I, I want to ask, you're one of the few black CFOs in the Fortune 500. And, you know, I'd like to, you know, hear a little bit about, you know, of that journey, what it was like, and, you know, how, how your experiences can help others. Yeah, look, my, my journey, I, I reflect on this question and I think about uh, when I first started with the firm, I remember because, you know, growing up, you don't see people who look like you in these positions, right? Uh, not sure. many of them anyway. And still today, uh, only a couple handfuls, if you will, of uh, black CFOs across the Fortune 500. So it's, it's underrepresented uh, for sure. And so coming up, I remember going into uh, major clients and meeting with CFOs or senior members of the financial organizations and thinking about what, what are they thinking when I walk in the room. Uh, and, and I remember almost giving myself a pep talk, if you will, because it, you know, these positions are not given out for free. <laughs> and it took quite a bit to get even to that point uh, in my career. So I had to sort of you know, step back and think about it and say, you know what, uh, if someone is having, you know, thinking about, you know, do you belong here or not and, and that sort of thing, let that be their problem. Uh, it really took a lot of hard work for you to get here and just focus on what you're here to, to deliver. Uh, and so that's, that was a threshold I had to get through. And I do think that uh, whether it's from a racial perspective, gender, or different backgrounds, uh, those that are underrepresented can sometimes uh, be in their own heads and not, not having seen folks who, who look like them. Uh, in terms of coming up. So, so that was one, one piece, uh, I would say, uh, that I, a threshold that I, had, that I had to get through. The other one is over my career, and I, we, we talked a little bit about uh, sponsors and mentors. The number of times I've had someone tap me on the shoulder and say, I want you to go do X. And while I was always ambitious, right, and, and I sought experiences that I felt, you know, titles can come and go, experiences are going to stay with you uh, for the rest of your career and the rest of your life, perhaps, right? And so I always valued experience a lot more than, uh, than title. But though I was working towards something I aspired to, when the time came and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, look, go do this, I never felt I was quite ready. And so again, uh, I, want, I wanted to go back to that point because I do think sponsors can be instrumental in terms of seeing more potential in you than sometimes you see in yourself. So I do think that's an element. But look, I, I do think as a CFO, and, and you can make this argument for virtually any position, uh, any leadership position, I take the mindset of replacing myself every two to three years. Uh, and doesn't mean I'm, I'm changing positions necessarily or leaving the company or anything like that. But I do think whatever it is that I'm personally responsible to make sure that I engage to get done, someone on my team or an individual on my team can do that within the next two to three years. That means I have to develop a pipeline, right? Uh, and that pipeline should also be very diverse. Diverse in terms of background, diverse in terms of the way they think, in terms of you know, gender, race, et cetera, uh, which is something that I'm intentional uh, about in terms of how, how I run my teams. That's fantastic. I, I think that's great. And, you know, corporate America talks a lot about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, both from the strategic benefit it brings, of course, but also simply it, it's kind of the right thing to do. But I, I think a lot of us still struggle with it. So what do you think we can do, you know, as business leaders to ensure that the next generation of Black financial leaders achieves its potential? Yeah, look, I think it's it's a responsibility that we have, right, to make sure that 
uh, we're building a pipeline and are thinking about the growth and you know sometimes more complexity that's coming in the business uh, across the landscape. I mean, look, today the world is a lot more dynamic, right? We wake up every day with some uh, different change that's happening that has an impact and implications on the business. And so as leaders, we have to make sure that we're developing the next generation of talent uh, as well. And so that's sort of the fundamental requirement, I would say. And then I think it's being intentional about making sure if you truly believe that a more diverse uh, leadership team is going to uh, be more productive and, and drive better performance, then it's then it, you have to be intentional about making sure uh, that you have a, a broad slate of individuals. If you see opportunities, uh, open positions that you're trying to fill, or new opportunity in terms of tackling uh, a challenge. As I mentioned, one of my prior mentors slash sponsors uh, having uh, uh, identified individuals within the finance function that could go and tackle the top six or seven uh, challenges that uh, the, the business was facing. And by doing so and making sure you have a diverse set of individuals that are going after those, then you're developing a diverse set of uh, folks as well, which is why I'm sitting here today. So I do think being intentional about it is, is what to do, but the primary mandate is really to develop a pipeline. Okay, that's fantastic. So I, I wanna change up a little bit. So um, can you walk us through like a particularly challenging moment in your career and how you tackled it and what some of the issues you faced were? Absolutely. I've had many. And so again, another <laughs> another piece that could take the entire segment, I would say, Jack, look, I, I happen to value the more challenging moments, the ones where I say, you know what, if I could go back, I'd probably do this differently. I value those perhaps more than the ones that were just knock it out of the park successes, because I think, you know, the latter tends to uh, leverage the strength that we already have, whereas the former tends to develop a new muscle and help develop an area that perhaps uh, you needed to grow in, right? And so I think that's a, an area, areas of growth. One of the immediate uh, ones that, that comes to mind, Jack, was having an opportunity um, to run a very major project and initiative that was on top of what I would call my normal day job. And, uh, and of course, I'm always looking to stretch others just like I've been stretched to help them develop. And in this particular instance, I, I stretched someone into a position where it was pretty obvious that they were not climbing to it despite you know, any help I was providing a guidance and support, et cetera, and just took too long to really do something about it. And I do think that uh, it doesn't mean that you don't give stretch assignments to individuals uh, and you want to do that and make sure you have the capacity as well to help them develop and grow, not just here, let's see how you do type of a thing. Uh, but at the same time, you also want to make sure that you don't hesitate on people moves when you see the need. And I think that's definitely a lesson that I've learned uh, along the way. Okay, that's fantastic. Cool. And this might be an obvious question because you just, you uh, described Zoetis so passionately. But uh, when you had the opportunity, what is it that attracted you to the role? Look, as I mentioned, Zoetis is a purpose-driven company, and not only the purpose that I shared earlier, but our core beliefs in terms of how we operate uh, form the basis for our culture as an organization. We continue to innovate and, and, and lead animal health in terms of driving better health for animals across the spectrum and across, across the globe. The thing that really I admired about Zoetis, first of all, it's how it got to be in its position, and it's through innovation, number one. But the other one is, I mentioned, we're really engaged in two, I would say, broad areas, right? It's uh, on the pet care side and then on the livestock side. And the human-animal bond is something that uh, really people around the world hold near and dear, and animals have become part of the family uh, as well, right? On the livestock side, this is where my background really connects, uh, uh, really with, with our, our mission and our purpose as a company. I grew up in Haiti, as I mentioned earlier, and certainly, uh, have firsthand uh, know what it's like to go really hungry uh, and firsthand uh, know what it's like to, to deal with malnourishment uh, as well. And so here's a company that its very purpose is to help feed the world and providing uh, um, you know, quality uh, um, animal protein to feed the world, the 8 billion people walking the planet today and the 10 billion that's to come. And that's something that I can really identify with given, wow. given my background as well. Yeah, that, that's great. And when we spoke earlier, you talked about you you encouraged the finance team to develop a customer appreciation. And it's really embedded in the culture that you're trying to create at your firm. And, uh, you know, clearly you're, you're passionate about that and very committed to it. But tell us a little about that. What's the relationship like between finance and sales and finance and marketing? 
I've always had this curiosity about business in general, right? And it starts with, why would a customer choose this company's products or services versus someone else? What is it that the customer values in that? What are the competitors? What are they doing? Uh, what are the suppliers that the company relies on? And so that curiosity is why, even back in high school, when I still had a very heavy accent <laughs> at the time and still learning how to speak English properly, I also was enrolled in a program called the Academy of Finance, and I was taking accounting classes and finance classes in my junior year in high school and so on. And so that curiosity is something that I think has served me well because it means that you're always are looking across the spectrum, not just in finance or in the specific department of function that you serve, but also looking from the outside in in terms of the, the surroundings of the business and the company. And so I try to stress that uh, across the finance function. I take every opportunity to go and meet with customers, uh, try to understand you know, their broader world, if you will, uh, so that I can better appreciate where our services and our products fit into that world and how we can better serve them in terms of how we bring our products to them, the innovation that we go after, and so on and so forth. And I always bring those stories back uh, to the teams internally, essentially bringing the customer to them, if you will, so that they can really look at it and say, so for example, finance may look at pricing. How do we really understand how a product should be priced if we don't fully understand what the value of that product is from the eyes of the customer? And so ultimately, I think that was, is the ultimate measure, right? And so I stress that with our teams and continue to encourage uh, that we do that. And the other thing that I do, Jack, is when I join a company uh, and I meet with my peers, I tell them uh, I'm in perpetual learning mode. <laughs> and so I want to make sure that my intentions are known, that I'm going to ask a lot of questions. It's really from that curiosity so that I can better serve them and better help them, and we collectively can lead the company better. And so yeah, that's, no. that really breaks down any sort of wall that might might otherwise be. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I, I've observed, and I don't have any data about it, but the the quality that really separates successful executives to me is it's not smarts because there are all of them, a lot of smart people out there, but it is the intellectual curiosity. It's the always be in learning type of mode. But it sounds like you've established like a really good relationship with sales and marketing and. You know, when I was thinking about it, I, I don't know if you ever saw a TV show called Faulty Towers. No, but I never saw it. It's, um, it's the people who created Monty Python. It was their okay. TV show, but they ran a hotel. And one of the famous lines they used is they, they were managing a hotel. And they said, this would be a great hotel if not for the customers. And <laughs> I actually worked with a guy who said something almost identical to that. It's wow. the same sentiment. I thought he was quoting Faulty Towers and I, I laughed, but... He was actually serious. He really thought it would be a great company with all the customers. So, Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's like, what kind of mindset is that? So, you know, good for you to in encourage otherwise. But like early in my career, I, I don't want to say finance and marketing were adversarial, but there was always sort of, there's always a little bit of it. They weren't fully collaborative. And in fact, my first CFO I worked for, he always called uh, marketing arts and crafts. You know, which I was 19 years old. It was funny at the time. As I look back, that's not really very helpful. Um, but in his defense, they call us bean counters. So, you know, there was a, a bad <laughs> what thing. But I, I never sensed he was kidding. Like, I never sensed he was trying to be funny by calling them that. But you've obviously created a culture where, you, you know, you respect everyone has an important role. And if the role wasn't important, you know, what's it doing here at all, right? Absolutely. Look, I, I've come to really appreciate that um, the further I am in my, in my career. Not only the, the purpose that they serve and how all the pieces have to come together, our brand and what that means, it helps us also not just with our customers, it helps us with you know, being able to attract and retain talent, et cetera. And so I do think that it's a, it's a critical role that all these functions play. But I wanted to go back for a second on uh, this notion of the, uh, the customer and why I want to make sure that the finance function is more connected to the customer and understand that and bring it back to the work that we do. Uh, I had an opportunity to run a business. And of course, I was in various you know, finance roles prior to that and then became CFO after that. And one of the big lessons that I learned was, I remember we had this project management function in the business and I was leading finance for that particular division uh, prior to this. And I always questioned why we needed as many project managers as we did. It wasn't really a profit center, although we charged for it, not enough to turn it into a, a profit venture, although the overall business was very profitable. And then I, I became president of that business and had the opportunity to meet with a lot of customers over a relatively short period of time. 
And as I reflected on, on those meetings with those customers, what I found was the customer was changing. Uh, and they were becoming a lot more of these biotechs, not just the large pharma that had ample departments and functions and experience in certain aspects of it, uh, but smaller companies and biotechs that were really focused on the science, uh, but the logistics of running clinical trials and the project managers that they needed, they didn't have that skill set per se. So they were actually relying more on us and not less, and the value we brought to those customers was far greater than, say, some of the larger uh, large pharma customers. And so I came back after all those meetings with those customers and, and doubled the amount of project managers that we had <laughs> in the business, having questioned uh, why we had as many as we did sitting in the finance seat and, and actually charged a lot more for their services because of the value that I saw that we were bringing. And it turned into a profit center and helped us drive uh, even further better growth for the overall business. So again, this is just another example that I think really underscores the importance of really understanding from the perspective of the customer. Yeah, it, it's what it's all about. And in, early in my career, the CFO, you know, sort of the, the traditional CFO, it, it, the role wasn't strategic. Often the best accountant in the company would become the CFO. And the role focused on financial reporting, of course, but, you know, compliance, cost containment, things like that. And, you know, over the time, it's be, it's gotten to the point where it's now, you know, truly a strategic role. I'd argue that it's probably the most cross-functional role in most companies. CEO, of course, is up there and maybe even, you know, the chief human resources person as well. But, you know, it's certainly in the top three. And I know you value the relationships you have with the president of the company, with the board, uh, you know, across the entire C-suite. And you love the idea of, you know, being strategic and growing the business. And I'm curious, it, it sounds like it sort of came naturally, but you were helped by that experience of running a business before becoming a CFO, right? Because it was, you weren't a CFO and then running a business, you ran the business and then became a CFO? That's right. That's right. Okay. So that must have been extremely helpful, right? To broaden the perspective. It was super helpful. Uh, not only the example that I shared earlier, but I came to appreciate a lot more the importance of when you set a strategy and you identify places that you want to deploy capital and invest in this in particular in this particular case it was a service business so it's really human capital that was really going into driving our growth and how we serve our customers and what i appreciated more after again coming into the seat of running the business was there were times when we would have a plan and we would set out to hire people into certain positions, et cetera, and we'd, we'd be falling behind that. That meant that the expenses were also coming in behind, and it was benefiting the P&L. And I saw the benefit of that from the finance seat. But coming in to run the business, what I saw was that I was delaying a critical uh, strategic step we wanted to take. And so while it was beneficial in terms of what the spend levels were on the P&L, it was delaying our ability to really get, get more on the uh, front foot in terms of driving growth. So so I could see that and appreciate that a lot more having been in that seat you know, than I could have uh, uh, in the finance seat for sure. Yeah, it probably makes all the difference, right? And I know there are some large companies they intentionally rotate, you know, have have a finance person work in marketing for six months. Not that they're going to bring a, a lot of value to marketing necessarily, but they're just trying to broaden that perspective, you know, have them just appreciate what actually goes on in marketing. And they identify people with you know, high potential for future C-suite members and whatnot. So Absolutely. it's great that you had that opportunity. So Indeed. And look, I want to key in on something you said just a moment ago, Jack. I think the role that we play, certainly we continue to wear that stewardship hat, right? We are, you know, protecting the company's assets, making sure that the controls are in place, we're executing appropriately and so on. That's a very important role that we continue to play. I just think we can also be stewards of growth and driving execution. Uh, in fact, if, if we're rightfully engaged on setting out what the strategy is, because we're so cross-functional, as you said, I think we're in a prime position to make the introduction between strategy and execution, if you will. And so yeah. I think the finance is right at the center of that to be able to drive the execution to bring that, that, ex to bring that strategy uh, to reality. And it's so valuable because in, unless you're the one in 100 companies where the CEO is a former CFO, uh, you're the only one who's both a financial expert and has strategic vision across the entire C-suite. It just it it makes the CFO role so critical right now, right? I mean, you, you know, you wouldn't want to invest in a company that didn't have a world class CFO running the financial operations, and you know, adding more than just finance and accounting. Clearly, that's what you bring, right? 
So. Look, th that's why I actually think I wear three hats, so whatever terminology we want to use, right? Uh, on the one hand, I'm leading a finance function. I have to set the goals and objectives for the function, uh, look at where our resources are allocated, making sure that we can play that stewardship role of protecting the company's assets, reporting accurately, and so on, but also make sure that we're, we have the right seat at the table in terms of engaging with the business and partnering with, with the business, etc. So that, I call that one hat. And then I wear a second hat where I call actually being the CFO, if you will. That's where I'm engaging with investors and making uh, capital allocation decisions and um, engaging with the board of directors, participating in the set of the strategy for the company. I call that sort of being the CFO, quote unquote. But then there's a third hat that I think actually fits in what you were just talking about, Jack, which is because we're able to see across the organization in the way that we are, across human resources and equality and operations and manufacturing, across the board, we are in a prime position to actually bring those together from an execution standpoint and drive that rigor as well. And so I think that's a third hat that might feel kind of like a COO. Again, I, I don't really uh, spend my time worrying about titles. Titles come and go. Experiences is what really matter. And I think that third hat is where I think you can really uh, engage uh, as a finance function, as a CFO, uh, to bring it all together. Makes a lot of sense. So cool. So um, this is the secrets of rockstar CFOs. And despite your uh, humility, I would certainly put you in that category. So I'm wondering if you can give any advice to the next generation of CFOs, things that they should start to learn, focus on, that'll make them, you know, help them get the role and then, you know, flourish once they have the opportunity. Absolutely. Look, I think there are a lot of different pathways that an individual could go through to, to land uh, in a CFO seat at some point. So there's no hard and fast rule or exact uh, path. But if there are a couple of things that I would that I would share, number one, it, it's back to what I said earlier, which is make sure you understand the business regardless of what role you play, what position you're in, what department you're in. Try to understand the company as broadly as possible, as well as from the outside in uh, and from the perspective of the customer, suppliers, competitors, et cetera. So that's the first thing. Be infinitely curious about the business and how it goes about, you know, meeting its customers' needs and why customers value it, uh, et cetera, and how it competes for the customer's needs versus necessarily against someone else. And I think that's really important uh, to appreciate and understand. The second thing I would say is be flexible uh, and be agile, be mobile in terms of what positions and experiences you get to have and have as broad and as be deep of an experience set as you can in the business. And, and maybe the last one is just be, be set aggressive goals for yourself, be aspirational, but be, also be patient um, in terms of how you get there. There might be a lot of different pathways, opportunities that come that give you a, a chance to experience something. I didn't necessarily set out to run a business, for example, uh, but the opportunity came. And although initially I said, well, I don't think I'm ready for that, uh, I did take, take on the opportunity and, it, and it's made me a better CFO today. So, so the pathways can be very varied. Uh, and not necessarily hard and fast, but be patient, uh, but also at the same time setting uh, the, the aspirational goals for yourself. That's fantastic. That's great advice. And we have a mentorship program, so I'm definitely going to share that with our uh, with the next generation of leaders. So cool. But so I, I want to close on sort of a personal note. A little birdie has shared with me that you are an accomplished chef. I don't know if they said chef or cook, but in particular, you like uh, creating some of the traditional Haitian recipes that you grew up with. Uh, tell us a little about that. Any uh, any particular specialties you have and how you got into that? Again, I probably wouldn't put myself in the category of accomplished chef, but I do actually enjoy, I enjoy cooking. It's one of the things I think that's one of those uh, de-stressors for me. If I can get in the kitchen, in particular, if I can make something that I don't need a recipe to follow, uh, and I'm not measuring anything, I'm simply throwing things in, that actually is a lot more relaxing for me uh, in the end. So, so I do tend to make a number of dishes, and, and some of them some traditional Haitian dishes. In fact, uh, every new year, I make this Haitian soup. It's a tradition uh, that I grew up with, and, and if you're a little kid in Haiti, uh, on New Year's Day, you will see a bunch of other kids carrying these little containers back and forth between houses. And it's because everyone makes a big pot of this soup and they want to share it with family and friends so everyone can taste each other's and kind of critique and, and, and all that sort of thing. So it's a tradition that I carry here. And in fact, I've made it and shared it with neighbors um, of mine. And, and it takes days to really prepare for it because I'm picking every single ingredient, I'm seasoning the wow. meat ahead of time uh, and go through the whole process. It's a pretty large vat. And so getting the flavor just right uh, takes a lot of uh, effort and energy, but, but I enjoy it. 
Oh, that, that's it's great to have an outlook like that. I was it was interesting because you mentioned you you don't like to follow a list of ingredients. You sort of do it intuitive and freelance. And yet I was thinking as you were telling me that, you know, this is a, a man who started his career in public accounting. So like in your <laughs> professional life, you know, at least at one point, it was probably all about following a prescribed path and a procedure and things like that. But it, it, you uh, sort of have that that wall in between the two. Yeah, I actually, I think it's one of the few places where I can actually be creative. And I think it helps balance things out a little bit from the accountant who is very structured and so on to be in the kitchen and, and really just throwing things in. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So cool. Well, this has been uh, a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. I know you're, you have an important job and you're a very busy man. So thanks for your time. I'm also excited to announce that Wetney will actually be our um, keynote speaker at our conference next June. It's the registration is not up or anything like that, but uh, hopefully we'll see each other between now and then. But worst case, we will see you in Boston in June uh, at what should be a fantastic event. Looking forward to it, Jack. And, and this has been my absolute pleasure. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. To continue your exploration of this role that focuses on strategy, leadership, finance, and technology, listen to more episodes of the show at rockstarcfos.com. Join this revolution episode by episode. Push yourself to achieve great things and unlock the best opportunities available to you. CFOs are creating a legacy, and it's time for you to leave your own unique imprint on the world today. That's all for now. See you on the next one.